Hey there, YouTube. Welcome on back to Artichoke Dip. My name is Rob, Solo Tabletop Gamer. And in this video, we're going to get into the third video in uh, this series, which is on the basic Dungeons and Dragons. Came out of the original box set from 1983. And inside the player's manual, it offered a solo adventure. And that's what I've been playing. And it's these last three videos have been fun for me. It's been, um, there's been things I have forgotten. I rediscovered again that put a smile on my face that I totally forgot about the, the humorous side of it. Um, and the surprise side of it and everything else that was just the magic of this RPG that it still holds to today for, I don't care if you're a veteran gamer or you're a new gamer going through this dungeon. I think everybody found at least something in it that either they loved or they hated about it. But nevertheless, I think everybody that played through this to a certain extent still remembers maybe a little bit about it. But with that being said, I would like to jump to the tabletop and get the video underway. But I got a few disclaimers I got to get out of the way first. And those are, first thing is, if you like the video, let me know. Click that like button and I'll make more content like this. And if you just stumbled upon my channel and you like everything with the tabletop gaming hobby from miniatures, miniature painting, terrain building, um, RPG gaming, obviously, board gaming that have RPG elements to them, you found the right place. Don't forget to click that subscribe button followed by the bell icon. Every time I do release new content, you're going to get a notification so you don't miss one. Now, with that out of the way, we're going to pick up where the last game session left off. And I'm going to get this out of the way here right now. If this is the first video you're watching, it may seem rather confusing to you, but it's still entertaining. I would suggest going back to the first video and watching that and watching them in order because then the whole adventure, the map, and everything will make far more sense to you than this. But you don't have to. You can just watch the video as is and enjoy it the way it is. And I hope you do. But with me getting that out of the way, where the last video left off was the thief was able to escape the clutches of the monster and he was running in a blood curdling scream panic down the corridor back towards his other companions let's get to the tabletop and let's see how this turns out all right my friends Okay, so it's at this is where we last left off. Roan Brenton, the thief here, was running down the corridor towards the door to get back to the statue room, screaming. In his pursuit was the rust monster right here. So this is where I'm going to start this round out. I'm going to roll a initiative die for the rust monster and roan brenton highest number obviously wins and we'll go from there so the brown d10 will be for rust monster the blue will be for the thief let's see what we have here oh okay so it'll be a six for the thief and a four for the rust monster so roan brenton comes screaming through the doorway back into the statue room just plowing everybody out of his way Crowley just <laughs> makes a growling noise like that and uh, the other hireling Duke Eldrick is like oh excuse yourself alright so now now 
this is what I'm going to do. Crawley, the veteran, growls and screams out, It's a damn mind tick. He's like, get, uh, get here against the wall. Don't let them feeler things touch you whatsoever. Otherwise, anything metal you got, it's gone. I've dealt with these in the mines before. And there's one way to deal with it. So, with that um, being said, I'm going to roll an initiative for these three to see who goes first in which order to move away from the doorway before the rust monster makes his way up here. All right, so that's going to be 3d10. I'm going to have to find another d10 here. Or do I? I'll just reuse this percentile die. Well, yeah, that'll work. So the blue d10 will be for the thief. The blue percentile d10 will be for the, uh, Caleb. And the brown d10 will be for the cleric. All right, so as we can see there, it's gonna look like the percentile, which will be the 10, will be, boom, right here, Caleb is gonna go first, followed by my thief, and then last but not least, the cleric. So, all right. He's going to move and position himself like here as a matter of fact to make this easier i'm gonna move the statue piece out of this area right here and i'm just gonna say he's up here snugged up right next to this statue like that just getting ready to line up the shot so to speak all right we'll move that over there now I'm going to put him over here because I didn't count him in the initiative round. He already hit the wall telling everybody else to get to the wall. All right. Next will be... He's going to just follow orders in 5, 10, 15, 20. He's already had enough of the rest monster. He doesn't know what to think. He's just destroying the whole dungeon. I'm just going to leave that off the board for right now. Just to put him there. Make this way easier. All right. And last but not least, the cleric hugs the wall nervously, not knowing what to expect, and pulls his mace out with a shaking hand, looking at it, going, oh. And uh, Crowley just growls and says, listen. You're going to see the antennae. They're going to come through the door. When you do, don't let them touch you. And just hit it with that mace on the back side of it as hard as you can. Once you bust it off, I'll cut it off with the sword. Once we take its weapon against them, at that point, yeah, we can just take them one-on-one -on -one and just get rid of this vermin once and for all. All right. So, now, with that, just... The next round, Rust Monster comes up. We've already determined he's not going to be able to make it through the door. He's quite a large creature. But why leave it up to chance? I mean, looking at the mini, he's probably not going to make it through the door. Okay, so let's get out the percentage dice. Let's see if this Rust Monster can squeeze its way through the door. What is... We'll say there is a 40% probability. <laughs> well, if I roll percentile dice, that would be good. Instead, I didn't roll percentile dice. Let's roll percentile dice and answer that question. I said it was a 40% chance. Let's see. So 59%. So no, he cannot make it through the doorway. So just as Crowley uh, predicted it would do, it made it up to the edge of the doorway and its antenna are poking around outside the 
doorway trying to get to any steel that it can and now with that being said we're gonna go back to the battle round um, rules how it works and if you remember that it's ranged magic melee <laughs> so first uh, one in the batting order is going to be obviously Caleb he's Caleb lines up the shot he's going to get a plus two to the roll because of his dexterity bonus is a tribute bonus is a plus two so a plus two to the roll for his bow and obviously because the creature is within short range he's going to get a plus one for that as well so he'll get a total of plus three to this roll Seven. Ooh, man. Yeah, the bonuses eight, nine, ten. Yeah, nowhere near where we need to be. So the arrow just whoo, bam sticks into the side of the stone. Doesn't even come anywhere close to hitting the rust monster. So next will be Crowley, the dwarf, and he takes, he moves up about five feet to where he can get it within striking range of the feeler. And well, he's going to get a, no, well, he's not going to get any bonuses to hit. He just has bonuses to damage. Yeah, he rolls a five. That's eh, not very good. So he oh, it misses completely uh probably bouncing his sword off the dungeon floor and going Rah! stay still you tick <laughs> um now the cleric and with a uh, shaky hand looking at the feeler he winds up the mace lining up the shot and let me see here if he's be able to pull this off or not. Oh my gosh. Oh man. You know, he rolled a one. Man, a one. What do you do at a moment like this? So normally <clears throat> most people would um you know say Oh, hey, this is a, you know, like a fumble, you know, any house rule you could put on that because it was just the worst possible rule you can imagine like get, right? And given through this entire dungeon crawl so far, this is the first time he has ever stepped up and done anything. And uh, I feel as if it's only, only right at this moment... <laughs> For Duke Eldrick, the cleric hireling, to learn all about the Crit Anomicon. If you're not familiar with this, this is a guide to critical hits, fumbles, and magical mishaps. This is truly a very evil book. So let's go to fumbles. Let's just see what's going to happen with a fumble. Hmm. Let's go to page 40 we'll start there let's go to the percentile chart why not let's see what could possibly happen with a fumble on one of these charts and for that we're gonna need percentile dice oh boy a 36 let's take a look at the caption of 36 and see what happens here 33 to 40 off balance negative four penalty to initiative Attack is a mess. Oh, man. So, mm, 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 mm. you know, what that's telling me is he fell off balance and put himself like five feet right in the striking range of the antennae feeler that are coming through the door currently. 
Oh, this may not bode well for old uh, Duke Eldrick. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. All right. So, I've been waiting for this part gleefully to see how this is going to work out. It has finally at last come to the other hireling, Ron Brenton, and see, uh, you know, how he's fared through the rust. If you remember, when he had the attack, he was shielding his hand over his sword from the uh, antennae that had him wrapped up. And when he finally broke away, he had his hand covering it. But this is what I want to know. This is the question that I have. Was his sword affected by the effects of the rust monster? But furthermore, what about the armor he's wearing? If this leather armor he's wearing has metal um, riveted areas on it, then wouldn't those be affected as well? Mm, food for thought, degrading the armor. Yeah, okay. Well, there's only one way to answer this. And that is with the oracle here. Let's see how the oracle is going to answer that. Was his armor and weapon truly affected by the rust monster's effects? A five. The unknown. No. So it was not just the dagger. Everything else is in pristine condition. All right. Well, this is a good, good thing. And let's see if Roan Brenton can redeem himself. And he's going to move five, ten, this way. He's going to move up here uh, trying to come in for an attack and bump the cleric out of the way so he'll be out of the line of fire let's see how this all works out so he's got a plus two to his dexterity hmm but i can't use it against this attack roll because he's going to attack in a ten eye so yeah, we'll just go against the AC of the Rust Monster. Let's just focus on that. 13 or better. A 7. Oh, man. That's pitiful. That is really pitiful. Oh, okay. Well, that's a miss. Now, it is the Rust Monster's turn. And clearly, the Cleric is right in the line of fire. So, the Cleric has um, leather armor as well, but he has a mace. And, ooh, he could potentially lose that mace. Let's see. So with his, his armor class is a six. And if we just do the simple mathematical formula, right? This is the way I do it. Six minus 10 is four, right? Four plus 10 is 14. So we have that right there, but for this guy, because he's is a more powerful creature, he's got five HD, um, he gets it's gonna lower, so it's gonna be a plus one bonus to him to hit, if you want to think about it that way, further reducing the armor class down to a 13, if that makes sense to you. So Let's see if he hits. Hmm, a 10. Well, 10 is a 10. It does not hit. He's lucky. So as the antennae comes in, and from, luckily, Roan Brenton throwing him off balance and out of the line of fire of the rust monster, he narrowly escapes an attack to lose his weapon. Okay, so... Now it's going to start a whole new round over again, and it's going to go back to right here on Caleb. And 
Well, Caleb's going to be like, move your head. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Lining up the shot with his bow. Let's see what he does. And you know what? This 20-sider has just rolled so freaking horrible. I think I want another 20-sider. All right, so let me, I'm going to hit that with a brand new 20-sider, not the one that's been rolling just low for everybody. See how this works out. So same as before, my dex, I got a plus two to the attribute and a plus one for being in short range distance, which is overall plus three bonus to the attack roll. But here is the whole entire caveat about this. My line of sight is blocked right now. The cleric is currently in front of the doorway. So for him to have any hope of making a shot whatsoever, he would have to fire above the cleric's head into that area. Now, if he gets a fumble, oh my God, that's going to be bad. That's going to be really bad. And let's hope we don't get a fumble because we might lose a cleric. <laughs> so let's see how this goes. All right, plus three to the roll. We gotta have a 13 or better. Oh, right there, right there, right there, right there. Got a 13, right on the money. All right, so let's go straight into weapon damage. That is gonna do a 1d6. Damage, and hope it goes high all right not bad not bad five so that's going to do a total of five points of damage they hear plop right into the armor of the uh rust monster and it lets out a loud like that and a rust cloud comes pluming out into the statue room all right Now, hmm. how do I want to resolve this? So I'm going to roll an initiative roll for Crowley and for Eldrick, the cleric, and see who, who is going to act first. If he's going to just continue out of his way of the attack and kind of um, regain himself, if you will? Or is it going to be him pushing him out of the way to get into the attack? So that's what I want to know. That's Let's roll two 10-siders for initiative, see how this goes. And, of course, the brown one will be the cleric, and the blue will be for the dwarf, Crowley. All right. There we have it, as we can see. Uh, well, looking at that, that's a nine. Um, yeah, it's going to be the cleric. He's, he wastes no time and he moves out of the way, away from the antenna. I'm going to put him up to 15 feet away. He's just, uh, extremely shaken right now and trying to regain his composure. So now... Now it is his turn, and Crowley steps up towards the doorway again with his sword. He ah, swinging at the antennae of the beast. No. Ooh. Oh man, I wish I could say it was a good roll, but it wasn't. And, um, yeah, he rolled a 10. There's not a whole lot he's going to be able to do with that. So, yeah, once again, ping, bouncing the sword off of the uh, dungeon floor. Rah, stop moving. And it'll go back to um, Ron Brenton, the thief again, who 
it takes another swing at one of the antennae. Ah, screaming out. Let's see if he's able to pull this off or not. Okay, he rolled a 12. And he's going to get a plus one from his strength, which will bring it up to a 13, which he will hit. He just... Wah, Let's roll the damage now. Uh, he's got a sword that does 1d8 plus 1. Well, not bad. Two points. Mm, we'll take it. Which will bring the rust monster down to 8 hit points of damage. So... The rust monster screams out in pain as one of the antennae is just cut right through with a sword and a reddish, crude-looking, dark rust color blood begins to seep from the end of the antennae and drip onto the entryway door. All right. Now it's the rust monster's turn. And, well, let's see with his antennae who he's going to try to attack first. Him or him, because now he's only got one. So we're going to roll a d6, and I'm going to say if it rolls high, it will be the thief. And that's a five. <laughs> Poor thief. Okay, so the last antennae left just lunges out like a whip towards him and let's see if the rust monster connects or not now ron brenton he has an ac of five which would bring it to him. obviously five plus ten is a 15 but because he has a stronger hd encounter he's going to get a plus one bonus to that which is going to bring it down to 14 so the rust monster only has to roll a 14 or better well, he rolls an 8. He comes nowhere near him. So, with the one antennae just oozing blood at this point, the, the other antennae reaches out in a whipping type of uh, motion, trying to desperately grasp at the sword that you can smell the steel and is hungry for more metal to digest and to rust. All right. No, let's see. Has the cleric regained himself yet? Has he composed himself? Well, this is how we can answer this. So let's go to his charisma role. And he's got a tribute, I mean. He's got a, a charisma of 12. I'm going to roll... 20 cider and i want to see how this goes so if he rolls within his attribute number of 12 or less he succeeds if he rolls higher and at that point he fails he's just going to be more or less shaken for the moment over here in the dungeon just trying to compose himself so let's get to that answer. Let's roll a 20 cider and see what we get. A seven. Okay, that's good. He composes himself and looks over his shoulder at the sight that he beholds. The, this now massive, at first what looked like a creature from hell that came after him is now wounded and grunting. He charges towards the battle area five ten fifteen gets up to here and with his mace he's just ah, focused on the antennae to take the other one out let's see if he is successful or not a 14 right there he rolls a 14 yeah he connects as he comes in he's just ah, and like with a divine, um, we'll say, influence, he 
his cloak is thrown back as the mace just comes down, connects with the other antennae. Now, let's see how much damage it does. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So the mace does 1d6 plus 1. Mm. Two points of damage. So, not bad. Not bad. But the antennae is still connected, but obviously most of the um, main tendons and structure of the antennae have been badly wounded and it's you can see where it's obviously deformed flopping and the rust monster once again <laughs> puffing out clouds of um rust into the statue room as it shrieks out in pain now hmm interesting interesting Mm-mm-mm-mm. How to resolve this one? It's the Rust Monster's turn at this point. Here's the problem. He's got a badly wounded antennae. He cannot get through the doorway because he's too large of a insect, if you will, animal, whatever, a Rust Monster. So we already tried that and came up with the same answer after rolling the dice. And what can he do? He's going to be severely limited. And I'm going to say for that, that's going to have to be reflected in his attack roll. Now, first things first, that's obvious. He's going to lose his bonus because of the broken antennae. So that'll take him to his normal, depending on who his target is right here. But eh, even with that, there has to be another penalty above that. And to resolve that, I'm going to roll a d4. A 1 through 2 will be 1 point. And a 3 through 4 will be 2. Let's see. That's a 3... So we're going to add a plus three penalty to the attack roll for whoever he decides to attack. So let's see who he's going to attack first. And to resolve that, it's very simple with a six-sider. One through two will be um, Crowley. Three through four will be Duke Eldrick. And five through six will be Roan Brenton. Let's see. May the best man win. A four. So that's going to be the cleric. All right. So the cleric connected with the mace and the follow through with the weight of the weapon. He lets it swing out. And as he gets ready to rebound and bring the weapon back up for the next attack, the rust monster sees to seize its opportunity, but does it. That's what I want to know. Oh, so he rolled an 18. And I can tell you right now, Duke Eldrick, he has an AC of 6, which would bring it down to a 14. But given his, um, the bonus to that, even being a 14, it would be 15, 16, 17 because of the bonus. He's rolled an 18. There's no disputing that. The, the antennae, even though it's broken, it has one last attack, surprise attack in it that the cleric just uh, greatly underestimated. And as the antennae lumbers up in almost a, we'll say, pathetic type of motion, it snaps forward quickly snapping into the mace all right and let's see this will technically be the second hit okay so the first attack and does duke alert have anything 
He has leather armor and he just has the mace. Okay, so now here is the question. It explains here with this encounter that the first hit can degrade a weapon and the second hit just completely rusted to absolutely nothing. Now, considering this is his first hit against him, I say we go with that. Now it can degrade his weapon. This is interesting. This is very interesting. So now the 1d6 would go to a 1d3, or rolling a d6 and just splitting it up into thirds and divvying out the points that way, 1 through 3. Hmm, interesting, interesting. All right, so that was the first hit, and it's going to degrade his weapon. So now... He will go from a 1d6 to a 1d3 plus 2 still for his strength bonus. Hmm. Okay. Now with that round over, it starts over again with Caleb. And Caleb, let's see if he winds up the shot again with the arrow. Just the study aim. The elven eye. All right, come on, come on, come on, come on. And he's going to get a plus two to the roll. Ho, 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 ho. A 19. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. That'll be a 21. That's just more than enough to devastate um, anything that would stand in this way. Uh, and with the arrow, it does 1d6 damage. Oh. One point but you know what no problem because i know how to resolve this so caleb lines up his shot and he has he waits for the antennae to move back into the position he wants he releases the arrow immediately the arrow just comes straight across the top of the antennae severing the rest of the tendon and it just falls and snaps off the end of the creature as it cries out and agonizing pain and a larger dust cloud comes billowing out into the statue room followed by a light misted spray of um rust monster blood that coats them all right that works out they'll resolve that Now, who's going to go next? Let's see if <laughs> Crowley, the dwarf over here, can actually um, redeem himself and try another attack on this creature. So, he uh, screams, that's it, that's it, now that the feelers are gone, attack! And pushes his way in. Just slashing his sword in through the doorway at the rust monster. Like this. <laughs> and he gets a 10. He barges his way through the cleric like, out of my way! <sighs> and completely misses his sword ricocheting off the bricks of the doorway. <laughs> All right, um... So next, I'm going to say will be Roan, uh, Roan Brenton. He's going to take his attack with his sword. And let's see how he does. A 19. He does very, 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 very well. So, he's going to do 1d8 plus 1 damage. Damn. So he's going to do a total of four points. And this is good. Just 
So Roan Brenton just comes, I want to say, tacti tact very tactically, swiftly and deadly around the corner with the sword. And as he lunges at the rust monster, he just <laughs> finds the spot right in between the two eyes of the beast. And it lets out a whimpering... <laughs> It begins to stumble backwards on its six legs. Its tail becomes off-centered, and it's extremely wounded as Roan Brenton extracts the sword out of the beast with it dripping its rust-colored blood. Yes. Now, last but not least is the cleric. And the cleric, looking at his mace and seeing it starting to rust over, just looks back at the rust monster. And he's just like, Ugh. Oh, just forgive me, Lord. And he steps in for the attack. Barging his way through, he swings wildly at the rust monster. He rolls a 12, plus his hit bonus being a 1, uh, brings it to 13, right? He just steps into the doorway and swings the axe down. He, a loud cracking noise of the shell can be heard, and the animal lets out a... and collapses to the floor, just completely dead. All right. Now... He's going, he only has to do, obviously, one point of damage to kill this thing. So even with his 1d3 mace, the creature will be dead. So he rolled a 2, 1 plus the strength bonus of um, 2. He's going to bring it to 3. The creature's more than dead. The mace connects and just finishes him off completely. All right. So this does open up another area of the dungeon. Which is right here. Because we searched this area, but we haven't checked to see where these areas go yet. So... Mmm, yeah, that would require tearing the map back down, but it would be worth it. Because now the rust monster has been defeated. It is dead. And we could continue on. Okay, so after the beast is slain, they decide to head back into this room to investigate what's further down the corridor there i set this marker here you can see this red marker this represents the dead carcass of the rust monster that would have sat like so inside the marker but because it there's this large dead carcass right there it's gonna make it a very difficult area to pass as a matter of fact i'm gonna make them um all roll a dexterity check to see if they're able to climb up over the armadillo like shell of the creature and make their way to the other side making it over this area right here of this creature down the other side and out into the room so let's see how this is going to work out. So first one, obviously, that's going to go is going to be Roan Brenton. After he sees the beast fall and collapse to the ground. And they take a moment um, to breathe and gather their senses about him. Crowley's like, ah, told you. I knew it was in you. You just had to have the right kind of motivation. That's all. That's all. He's like, you first. You've been doing good so far. You seem to be bringing us a lot of luck. I might take you along on more adventures. We'll see. 
But he goes, as of right now, get in there and tell us what's going on in the room. So Ron Brenton is like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. He said, it felt good to kill that thing. He took a perfectly good dagger from me. And um, Crowley's like, Ugh, what do you mean? Don't worry. There could be more weapons in there. There could be loads of treasure and gold and 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 fine armor we don't know he's like but we won't know until you get going so ron brenton's like okay 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 he takes a firm grasp on his sword as he begins to climb over the beast uh with his adrenaline just peaked from the previous battle let's see how he does First things first, let's set the difficulty class for this. So 10 being the baseline for the difficulty class. And for this, I'm not going to set it too high. As a matter of fact, I'm going to roll a 1d4. And we'll see where that falls. So it could be a difficulty anywhere from 11 to 14. We just don't know. So it'll be a 12. So everybody will have to have a 12 or a better to be able to clear this area. Okay. So first one is Roan Brinton. And he has a plus two to his dexterity. 11, 12, 13. Okay. So he is able to do it. He uh, has no problems. He grabs a hold of the large um, armor-plated scales of the rust monster, pulls himself up, and then slides down the other side of the armor armadillo-shaped shell out into the room. The next one is Crowley. He does, well, tries to attempt to do the same with his sword drawn. Let's see... Uh, how he makes out on this. So he does not have a dexterity bonus. He's just going to have to roll a 12 or better. He rolls a 19. So to everybody's surprise, he goes over there and he's like, oh, out of my way. And he grabs a hold of the scales, pulls himself up, kicking his dwarf legs over and comes sliding down the backside of the shell with his sword out in an attack position in case anything goes to attack him on the other side of the shell and he slides up right here by Ron Brenton and he's like ah what's going on now I'm gonna have them as a matter of fact I'm gonna have Ron Brenton do this and well he doesn't have a wisdom bonus and how do I want to do this? Oh, I could do a hide in shadows roll. I could do that. And this is what I'm going to do with my percentile dice. I'm going to roll for the nasty creatures getting ready to come out of the shadows in this room. And currently... <laughs> they have a 99. Okay, so this is not going to be hard to do at all. But there is a 1% chance that Rowan Brenton wouldn't see this. So to be fair, let's roll a percentile dice for it. 57%. Uh, yeah, he sees it. So as Rowan Brenton slid down the backside of the rust monster and hit his feet and started to move out, that's when his gaze fell upon this sight and that sight being he sees creatures coming out of the shadows moving quickly down the hall from this area like so all right so now with that being said um, he motions to Crowley and says, there, there. And 
now Crowley can see them as well. He can see what's getting ready to um, happen. Caleb is the next one that's going to pass the area down in here over the dead rust monster. And he has a dex bonus of two. <laughs> a 20. Yeah, okay, so, yeah, he, uh, zero problems, as a matter of fact, uh, kind of cinematic, the way I'm thinking about it, like, maybe the Lord of the Rings thing from Legolas, where he comes running in, he grabs a hold of a piece of the scale and flings himself over the shell acrobatically through the air, and he lands on his feet behind them with his bow up. <laughs> and last but not least is the cleric. Uh, the cleric, Duke Eldrick, his, he's got a plus one to his dex bonus, so let's see if he's able to do it. Holy cow, holy cow, talk about divine intervention. Yeah, he has no problems crossing this area over into here. As they begin to disperse this way out into the room... that point um yeah it doesn't take Caleb too long to figure out what they are looking at and getting ready to do battle with so with that being said I'm gonna go back to the 10 siders and I'm gonna roll the brown one for the encounter side and the blue one for our side. I want to see who goes first. Actually, them. They came in an eight. We had a seven. Okay, so let's take a look at the goblin. And I'm going to need a little bit more information on them. So right here we have they have a move of six, which is going to be 35 feet is how I'm going to... I'll show you. Oh, I'm sorry. Armor class six. I am stupid. A move of 30 feet or 90 feet if they are charging. Hit dice, one, negative one. So a D8, negative one, or another way to look at that. You could have that D8 in half and just say they have four hit points, which works well too. Damage by the weapon, number appearing, two to eight. They save as a normal man. Their morale is between 7 or 9. And they have a different treasure type. Their alignment is chaotic. And they have an XP value of 5. Okay, so... Here we go. They have a move of 30 feet. So they move into position. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30... 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Boom, 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 boom. <clears throat> now, we could go off the reaction chart to see how the goblins react. Or we could just assume that the goblins are going to attack. Or there is another way to see how the goblins react. I got a reaction die here. I'm going to roll that and see what they do. Hmm. So as they enter the room cautiously, they look suspiciously over at the group of adventures coming in. And now, are they going to attack? They seem very suspicious of this. Don't know. They only got four hit points and an AC of six, which means we just need a 14 or better to hit them. Okay, but let's go back to the Oracle and see. Let's see what the Oracle says. Do they attack? That's going to be a 10. Let's see what the 10 says. Well, the 10 on the Oracle says no. 
but there's a reason for it over here and I gotta roll to find out why. A six. Sublimely bad or good timing by a sudden event. Hmm. I know how to take care of this and I know how they are going. They're not going to attack right off the bat. As they enter into the room one by one, and their eyes are able to make out what they're looking at back here. And they can see the corpse of the dead rust monster onto the floor. And they peer with an almost look of sadness in their eyes over at the adventures. And at that point, they let out a very horrific type of um, monstrous scream with their mouths opened up to expose their pointy sharp teeth all right oh boy this is gonna be good so let's start the initiative round of uh and of course that's gonna go to ranged first which will be caleb and with the way that they're lined up here obviously he's got complete blockage of line of sight this way and he is actually in between squares. He's like this right here. So I'm going to say the first thing he does, he's going to take a five foot step this way to line up a shot and he's going to fire his um, bow. But to be fair, even because they're in short distance, he would normally get a plus one. I'm not going to give him that plus one, but he will get a plus two for his dex bonus. So let's see how this goes. I'm going to need a 14 or better to hit him. 11, 12, 13. Close but no cigar. The arrow whoo, goes past the first goblin's head and just punches into the um, brick stonework behind him in the wall. Okay, now it's melee time. Hmm. Oh boy, I can already see how Crowley is going to react to this. How does Crowley react to this? Crowley reacts like a dwarf would react. With uh, the look of rage in his eyes and the blood vessels being, start beginning to rupture and his eyes turning red, a deep blood red, he screams out Wah! in a berserker type of, of scream and makes his way past Caleb here, going 5, 10, 15, 20. As he comes in, lunging at the goblin, with his sword swung up behind him to just completely devastate him. Let's see if he's able to do it. He rolled a 15, more than enough. Yeah, we, we're just going straight to damage resolution. It gets a 1d8 plus two. That's a five, it'll be a seven. You got four hit points. He just comes in in a blind rage and just strikes the goblin completely down, severing his head from his shoulders. Okay. Now, next is the thief's turn, Roan Brenton. And Roan Brenton looking at the situation, what is he going to do here? Hmm. I don't know if I want to put him in direct combat. I really don't. I think he's going to... Um, move this way, 5, 10, 15, 20, and he's going to duck down behind the barrel, waiting to see if the goblins are going to move in to attack Crowley or not, and if they do, yeah, he might be able to have a nasty, nasty surprise for him, but here's the thing, 
I gotta roll a hide in shadows save to see if, well not save, but skill I say, sh should say for uh, Rowan Brenton. And his hide in shadows is a 10%. So he's gonna need a 10% or less in order to pull this one off. He rolls a 59%. Yeah, even though he tries to conceal himself behind the barrel, you know, he, the goblins can obviously see him. They can see his cloak, you know, spread out on the floor behind the barrel. It's more than obvious. He's there. They're, they're not fooled. And that will bring us to um, Duke Eldrick, which Duke... Yeah, he's a cleric, so he's not really for killing, and he's going to reserve himself, so he just pretty much stays in the shadows here, just watching what's going on at this point. All right, so now it goes over to the goblins. First things first, we got to see. Their morale. They have a morale of, it says seven or nine, and see below, you know, let's see if we can get to, there's 20% chance that when goblins are encountered outdoors, one in every four will be riding a die roll. Okay. Um, the goblin morale is nine rather than seven, as long as their king is with them and still alive. Okay, so king, that could be a use, uh, loosely used term where you could be like a lieutenant or in boss or something like that then their morale will be raised when they're in the presence of them it'll be a nine but just on their own like this they got a morale of seven so we're gonna roll 2d6 and see what happens if they have a seven or more um you know their morale's high they're gonna stay and fight seven or less they're they're gonna boogie out of town they got an eight. <laughs> so yeah, they're they're in it to win it. Um so the goblin looking at Crowley narrows his eyes and takes a fresh grip on a spear and goes lunging towards Crowley, screaming, Aah! and then this guy right here, is he gonna go after Caleb? Or is he going to go after the thief hiding in the shadows? which the cleric is actually doing a better job of. Hmm. Let's see. Let's roll a d6 and call it high. There's a higher probability he's going to go after him being in the open and low rather than him. Uh, one. Uh, no, he's going to go after the thief. So he makes his movement. Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. He comes screaming at the thief with his spear raised above his head nah! all right let's see how these attack rolls play out first one against crawley that would be a 12 well luckily for crawley he has an ac of four so he's gonna have to have a 15 or better to hit him no no dice that time what about this guy No, a seven. Even though the goblin tried being extremely um, intimidating, he still fell short for his stature. And, well, Roan Brenton doesn't look too impressed at this point, we'll just say. New battle round. Now, the battle round obviously starts out with ranged first. What are we going to do? We're going to move to get a better line of shot on him. Or just take this line of shot. But he is behind cover. So he's going to get a bonus to his AC. Hmm. If I take a five foot movement here, I could be in perfect range of him to take care of him. No doubts that, well, if Roan ran into too much trouble, Eldrick is always right over here. You can always lend a hand. So I think that's the best course of action. He takes a five foot step that way, lines up a shot, and let's see if he gets it. He gets a plus three to the roll. Dun, dun, dun. 
what could possibly happen? Well, to answer that question, it's time to go back to the Criticonomicon. And in the Criticonomicon, let's go to fumbles and we will go to the percentile fumble chart again. Rolling them percentile dice. 51. Oh, man. So, this is the way that it reads the description in here. It just says, Bobble's weapon flat-footed while trying to recover it. One round. So, mm, Bobble's weapon while trying to recover it. I'm going to say as he took his five-foot step this way, he released the arrow and noticed the arrow went off wide because, well... He tripped over his own feet, fumbling the attack. Oh, that sucks. All right. That takes care of that. Now, Crowley's going to go first against the goblin. Let's see how he does. Uh, 10. And a plus 2 is a 12. In order to hit the goblin... He's going to need a 14 or better. Mm -hmm. No cigar. All right. What about... <sighs> I know Rowan could pull this off. Well, if anybody can, it'll be him. Let's see if he can do it. Gets a plus one to his roll. A 14. Plus one is a 15. That's good. He still has a sword that does a 1d8 plus one. Let's see what he does to this goblin. Two plus one is a three. Okay, so he doesn't entirely kill him, but he does wound him very bad as he backswings his sword, just cutting open his abdomen. Abdomen. The goblin staggers backwards, trying to desperately hold his internal organs in. Well, he's right here. He's in bad shape. He's about ready to spiral the drain and die. All right. Now, that leaves the cleric. The cleric's not going to intervene. He doesn't believe in killing. That would go against his alignment. Yes, alignment. Remember alignment and how alignment always played in to the earlier versions of this yeah so he's appalled as to what he's seeing he's just kind of sitting it out he's like mm -mm. he's not doing senseless killing for no reason um so now it passes over him and it goes back to the ranged shot again oh no it does not i almost forgot about the goblins it's the goblins turn how could i forget about that so He's going to take his attack against Crowley. Let's see how he does. He rolled a 19. Holy cow. So, as Crowley stepped, um, we'll say, off balance for a moment, I guess would be the best way to explain it. He uh, unexpectedly found a spear lining up the deadly shot and let's see how much damage it does so the spear is gonna do i'm gonna say it's gonna do 1d4 damage that's what i'm gonna roll with it does one point of damage to crowley crowley rawr! as he grabs a hold of the the spear and whips it out of his uh punctured area of his armor Okay, second attack will be this goblin, and let's even just see what he's going to do. I'm going to roll 2d6 for the morale for him. I want to see if he's even going to pass his morale check. A five. No, he's just, he's completely, um, 
in survival mode and begin he turns away to begin to leave the area of battle trying to hold everything together okay there is that now goes to the new round which goes to the elf caleb he gets a plus three to his roll again 19 this is this is gonna be it i think this will be it rolling a three he sends a just a devastating wound into this goblin reducing him to one point of damage the goblin staggers backwards for a moment in shock just looking down realizing there's an arrow shank sticking out of his chest and now goes over to crowley Crowley just giggles. Ha 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 ha. Yeah. Now try this and winds his sword up. And the plus two. He's got a 15. Now take it up to 17. He's done more than. Yeah. He's going to roll a 1d8 plus two. He does eight, nine, ten. Ten points of just devastating damage. Crowley just steps in like a baseball bat. <clears throat> right through the abdomen of the creature. Just slicing them in half. All right. Now, last but not least, will be Roan. And what is Roan Brenton going to do? I think. Hmm. What can, can give him a plus two? So I'm going to allow him to put his dexterity bonus onto his attack roll as he moves in like this to do his final attack to right into the back of the goblin. All right. Let's see if he's able to pull this off. Now the goblin has an AC six, which is going to be a 14. So he's going to need a 14 or better, but he gets a plus two to it. Ooh, right there. He's already rolled a 14. So he just comes up behind him with the sword. <clears throat> a mercy kill, if you will. That's a 7. Plus his strength bonus of a 1 would bring it up to an 8. The sword just <clears throat> punctures right through the goblin's chest cavity. And he sees it turn for a moment and... <clears throat> be tore right out of his chest and the goblin just everything just goes splat to the dungeon floor as he collapses into a puddle of his own guts all right that is that now we have to see i have another die to resolve this and it's a pretty cool little die kind of tells you if these goblins have anything worth of value on them so let's say being pretty low for anything really valuable like 20 percent anything below 20 percent they don't have an extremely valuable item on them 22 <laughs> percent so yeah it's not below a 20%, so they don't. They just have standard treasure on them. Let's see what they have. Okay, they have some precious stones, gems, something of that nature. They do have spears. They do have weapons. And for the third one, hmm, a potion. Hmm. Hmm. So these are all things I can put into the hirelings inventory and reference back to. Should be interesting. So we now have, I'm going to say, two spears. One D4 damage. Okay. We have found a gem. 
so I'll just write down one gem and then one unknown potion. I will have to get that appraised to find out what it is. Okay, so let's read, let's go to the next heading into the book. And the next heading says, when you complete this adventure, you get experience points. First add up all the treasure you brought out of the dungeon, ignore anything you've lost, and figure out how much it is all worth in gold pieces. The explanation of money systems is on page 10. You will get one XP for each one gold piece worth of treasure you find. In addition to getting the treasure, after adding up the treasure, find out how much experience you get for slaying monsters according to the chart. So we did the giant rats, that'd be five each. We did the goblins, that would be five each, but we did not do the skeletons. Didn't even know there were skeletons in, in here. I don't remember those. But, um, and then the rust monster, which is 300. Okay, so that's pretty cool. I can break out that experience between my two characters. Right there and right there. And that would give them both 150 experience each. Pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, gold, well, so they found 10 silver pieces, five gold pieces, two spears, one gem, and one unknown potion. Oh, and do not forget about the key. They found a key that did, would not work the door. So, at this point, this will conclude this solo adventure, but I could keep going on further down the corridor. We could just keep moving things on with randomized tables. But, should be. There we have it, folks. That's going to round out this video series. Now, before you say, no, no, artichoke, no, 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 no. What I meant is this is going to round out this video series for the solo adventure as written in the player's manual. Now, moving on, if you'd like to see more videos on basic Dungeons & Dragons, let me know. Drop me a comment. And tell me what you would like um, to see. Would you, you like the character lineup? Did you like how I did um, the voicing over in it and how I found the thumbnails for the characters and so on and so forth? Personally, my favorite and the fun I had through the editing was with Crowley, the dwarf. Um, I think the thumbnail just nailed it. I, I loved the thumbnail art and um, it just really inspired me to want to push Crowley a little bit further over the edge. Um, and I, uh, I love it. That's the magic of solo RPG. Actually, it's the magic of any RPG game, uh, you know, truth be known, is the fact that you you create a fictional character that's nothing more than a few numbers and uh, references on a sheet of notebook paper and before you know it it becomes its own person in your mind that um has its own life and um we'll put how do i put this its own intentions, we should say, <laughs> within this game world that um, it's going to do regardless. It's almost like regardless of whether you're rolling the dice or not, um, that character has taken on a life of its own and it's going to pursue that. So that's the fun. That's the magic of RPG games. And for me, the difference between tabletop RPG games and electronic games where electronic games um you're going to have obviously your cutscenes and you're going to have uh character interaction with NPCs and to a limited amount you have some freedoms to be able to choose and make a story go the way that you want but ultimately at the end, it's you're only going to have a couple of outcomes, how those 
are going to end depending on how they were written. Whereas if with these type of games, nobody knows how they're going to end, when they're going to end, or how long they can run for. It's just all up to you. And which poses me with this question to you guys out there. Would you like to see more D&D? Would you like to see more basic Dungeons and Dragons? Would you like to see more of Crowley? Would you like to see um, more of this character lineup that I have going through these dungeons, these, what should say, first level miscreants is what they are? Um, let me know. I can tell you, honestly, uh, these characters, just the way they are with the two hirelings, is fun. And these are not going to be characters that are going to go in away by any time soon, by any stretch of the imagination. These are, I, I really like the dynamics of this group, how it worked out. It was just great. I loved how, you know, it started out with the feeling like Caleb was going to be the crew leader, if you will, and it was going to be the most knowledgeable and um, he was going to be the one, we'll say for a better word, going into the dungeon and kicking down doors, kicking ass and taking names later. And then it turned out to be Crowley. Crowley was the one that was like, okay, enough of this foolishness. We're going this way. This is what we're going to do. And then at the moments um, where, you know, Crowley should have um, put his money where his mouth is. And the true danger, you know, arose, reassuring the thief that he was going to be there. He, he, you know, he had his support. He had all of his experience, the strength and the might of his sword and everything. And then once, you know, stuff went bad, he was the first one out the door. <laughs> um, so I liked that. I, I, I liked it. I had a lot of fun with it. And I hope you guys did too. I hope you did too. And I appreciate each and every one of you each and every one of you that have subscribed to the channel that comment that watch from the bottom of my heart thank you so much thank you so much for tuning in to watch this and like i said if you would like to see more just let me know and with that being said my friends this is artichoke dip signing off Oh, <laughs>